Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it is my great pleasure to join with you tonight virtually, uh, joining you from the U.S. Embassy in Warsaw, uh, and um, really looking forward to, to this discussion. Uh, it is, I think it's a, looking at the, the topic, it's something that is so uh, I, I don't know what to expect in a way. So I think that's always really, that's really exciting uh, looking at as a, you know, I, I am, I'm a mom of three kids. So of course, playgrounds caught my eye. Uh, I am a longtime city dweller and I know the importance of, of playgrounds in, uh, in cities. And I think um, having our expert Alexandra bring um, a certain context to in the relevance of reconstruction, I think, and hearing what you have, you all have to say and what your your questions are and uh, what your feedback is. Uh, looking forward to a really great dialogue. I wanted to especially welcome everyone and say a special thanks uh, to our partners, uh, to my colleague at the embassy, Marjana, who's worked who you all know and has uh, worked so uh, closely with you all uh, through the duration of the project. And um, especially thank our guest speaker for joining, for spending time with us uh, this afternoon and evening. Uh, so with that, a very warm welcome and looking forward to this discussion. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, so now let's uh, welcome Alexander Lang, who is our expert and who will be speaking about to us today about play actually. And Alexandra is a design critic, uh, so it means that she writes a lot about design and architecture, and her texts appeared in many magazines like the New, York, New Atlantic, New York Magazine, The New Yorker, and The New York Times. She also contributes to the Bloomberg City Lab and has written for Design Observer, Design, and Curb. And today she will be talking, as we already mentioned, about play from a bit of an unobvious perspective. And the topic of play is also connected to her uh, book, the design of childhood, how the material world shapes independent kids uh, that was published in 2018. So yeah, Alexandra, the uh, floor is yours and we're looking forward to the uh, talk. Great, um, hello everybody. And thanks so much for the invitation to speak to you today. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen because uh, I have lots of fun images of historic playgrounds to show you. Um, and I'm really excited today to take you through like a very abbreviated history of playgrounds in Europe, the US and Japan in the late 19th and 20th centuries. And I'm happy to take all your questions at the end. As you'll see from my presentation, I really think that the history of playgrounds is also a history for the fight for children's rights what kinds of activities help with healthy physical and intellectual development, how much uh, space children should be allowed to take up in the city, and how much freedom children should have to set their own path for play. So play and grounds for play have been sites of education and joy and resilience for a very long time. So I'm really hoping that this history is going to inform and inspire you as you make your own plans as part of this project. Um, and I will say that sadly, this is not the first time that playgrounds have been called upon to knit cities back together, um, but we can always hope that it will be the last time. So the story I'm gonna tell you today begins in Philadelphia in 1876. Um, in 1876, the Centennial Exhibition opened in Philadelphia and alongside pavilions containing goods from countries around the world, there was one women's pavilion. Women's work was originally supposed to have shown, been shown in the exhibition's main building, but it was pushed aside when organizers received too many requests from foreign exhibitors for space. So the members of the Centennial Committee, who were all women, quickly raised um, $31,000 of their own money, which was enough to pay for a pavilion, a series of outdoor symphony concerts, a cookbook that they published, and in a separate cottage, a kindergarten. Elizabeth Peabody, who was a Boston-based education reformer, initiated the plans for this centennial kindergarten based on the educational strategies of the German teacher Friedrich Froebel. The kindergarten, she said, was supposed to be a republic of children, 
which was contrasted in every particular with the old fashioned school, which is an absolute monarchy. So when visitors entered the kindergarten cottage, what did they see? They saw a classroom led by the teacher, Ruth Burrett. And in that classroom, Burrett patiently explained the Froebel method to thousands of visitors as 18 children who were taken from a nearby charity home followed a typical kindergarten routine of playing, singing, movement games, and manipulating Froebel's gifts. Children sat around the long table that you can see in this illustration, playing with blocks, weaving with paper, and assembling triangulated structures out of hardened peas and toothpicks while Burrett and other teachers offered guidance. Froebel, um, who was born in 1782, was a polymath, very gifted in drawing and other forms of visual communication. As a teenager, he had trained as a woodsman in the Turingen Forest, learning about botany and forestry, and he had dried and mounted and classified his own sets of local flowers and leaves. He initially lurked for work as a surveyor and continued considered becoming an architect, but then he decided to teach. And it was on a two-year break from teaching from 1814 to 1816 that he organized the Mineralogical Museum of the University of Berlin. And this long meditation on the physical qualities of crystals gave him deep insight into the patterns of nature. Um, and he wanted to pass this insight about these patterns onto children, but the crystals he'd been working with were too precious to place in the hands of children. So instead, he made a set of spheres, cubes, and cylinders out of the material of the forest, wood, and he called these first 10 teaching objects gifts to emphasize the ideal education relationship between the adult and child. The adult was not the instructor, but was giving the children the gift of this toy to explore on their own. To Froebel, um, blocks weren't something that you just dumped out on the floor, but they were tiny sculptures that were presented with ceremony in slide-topped wooden boxes. Um, this is an example of one of the original Froebel block sets, which were made by Milton Bradley, which is still a major games um, maker today. And when you slid back the, back the top, nestled inside, you saw this cube of cubes. If the word gift suggests the spirit, kindergarten, which is in fact a word of Froebel's invention, suggested the form of this new system of early childhood edu education. It was half garden and half schoolroom. And indoors, children sat at those long slate top tables, which were all marked with a grid. And the space in front of each child was her workspace into which his gifts would be introduced one at a time to be used until the children had derived all the lessons from them that they could. But outdoors, um, Froebel designed a model garden for the children, which had communal flower and vegetable plots running down one side and individual beds of herbs, oils, and cereal plants down the other. As people have become freshly aware of the history of outdoor education, um, especially during the COVID pandemic, Froebel's outdoor classrooms have really taken on new meaning. Um, and they were already precursors for projects like the Chef Alice Waters Edible Schoolyard Project, which operates um, in Berkeley and New York City and several other cities. Um, so I guess I wanna underline here that these early childhood education systems the learning was really split between indoors and outdoors and hands-on work was the foundation of learning in both locations. So the Froebel blocks established an alternative model for early childhood education in America that wasn't so book-based and wasn't based on rote learning and repetition. But the American kindergarten movement, which was largely led by women, was not really satisfied with Froebel's um, gridded table and formal exercises. They felt that his idea of teaching young children was too abstract and his structures were too distant from everyday experience. So why should children, especially the urban children that they serve by and large, not build what they could see with the naked eye, which tended to be buildings rather than nature? So Caroline Pratt, who you see here, who founded the city and country school in Manhattan's Greenwich Village, also let blocks be her curriculum, but her blocks and her system of block-based education was very different from Froebel's. 
Pratt's blocks are commonly referred to as unit blocks, and the basic brick has a one to two to four proportion. Unit blocks are large enough to be used on the floor, but also small enough for even a three-year-old to manipulate and build something with. So Pratt's blocks, which remain a staple of the block play area at most preschools, foreshadow some of the modular pleasures of Lego, um, as the smaller parts can be used to make larger holes out of squares, triangles, or arches with the semicircular openings. The blocks with that one by two proportion, which are known as brickies, always seem to be used up the most quickly, which forces children to assemble the more idiosyncratic pieces like the squares or the right triangles back into the satisfying form of the bricks, which teaches basic principles of geometry. And Pratt's version of the outdoor classroom wasn't an herb garden like Froebel, but walks through Greenwich Village in which children would interview workers and observe the different workplaces around the school close at hand, um, including shops, the local post office, and even the dock workers on the west side docks. Um, today, uh, the city and country schools still exist, and students now create their own in-house versions of these institutions. In third grade, um, the whole class tapes out a city map on the floor and builds structures out of those same blocks, as well as a whole host of art materials that they scavenge and, and harvest. Um, the nine-year-olds run a school post office down to designing and producing postcards on the school's letterpress. And they also run around the school delivering notes, taking on a few of those adult roles that they've already observed outside their classroom in the city. But parallel to these early development of systems for childhood education, American reformers were also working on systems for outdoor play. So the first American playground had no climbing bars, no seesaws, and no swings. In 1885, a group of female philanthropists decided that the immigrant children in Boston's North End needed somewhere um, other than the increasingly crowded and dangerous streets to play. So they pay, paid for a pile of sand to be poured into the yard of a chapel on Parmenter Street at the beginning of the summer. Um, and Kate Gannett Wells, who was chair of the Massachusetts Emergency Hi and Hygiene Association, wrote that playing in the dirt is the royalty of childhood. This idea also came from Germany, where such sand gardens were introduced into Berlin's public parks in 1850 as an offshoot of Froebel's emphasis on the garden. Um, education reformers like Peabody brought, brought both the idea of the early childhood education and these blocks and gardens to America. But as the number of such gardens increases, increased, they began to be located in schoolyards and eventually became the property of the schoolyard and school board and the parks department. A 10 acre outdoor gymnasium with above ground play equipment, like swings and seesaws, as well as the sand opened um, in Boston's West End in 1889. And by 1890, there were about 20 other playgrounds in Boston. Um, one opened in New York that year and another that you can see here in Chicago at reformer Jane Adams's Hull House. The Hull House playground was among the most elaborate with sand piles, swings, outdoor building blocks, and a giant slide and ball courts for older children. The Playground Association of America was founded in 1906, and it sought to organize the efforts of these reformers in multiple cities across the US to get public financing for outdoor recreation. Um, they were very lucky in their patronage as then President Theodore Roosevelt, um, who's commonly known as a friend of the outdoors and national parks, was elected honorary president of the Playground Association and actually received the association's leaders at the White House. In a 1907 letter to the head of the PAA, Roosevelt wrote, city streets are unsatisfactory playgrounds for children because of the danger, because most good games are against the law, because they are too hot in summer, and because in crowded sections of the city, they are apt to be schools of crime. Um, older children who would play vigorous games must have places specially set aside for them. And since play is a fundamental need, playgrounds should be provided for every child as much as schools. 
This means that they must be distributed over the cities in such a way as to be within walking distance of every boy and girl, as most children cannot afford to play car fare. Uh, in 1887, um, Charles Stover, an activist who also advocated for public ownership of the subway system, proposed a New York City law allowing the city to spend up to $1 million a year on small parks and playgrounds, but the city didn't actually spend that money until 1901. Instead, private funders began to sponsor the opening of a few small play spaces, which were typically little more than those sand piles bordered by three building walls or a small ball court. But finally, in 1901, the city got involved and started building playgrounds at a much larger scale. Um, and the most famous of these is Seward Park on the Lower East Side in Manhattan, which the city finally opened um, in 1903, making it the first of what are now 700 New York City playgrounds. The city really changed the nature of the playground um, when it took over, though, instead of it just being this kind of anarchic sand pile, now we got architecture, um, the limestone and terracotta park pavilion um, with the arches that you can see in this picture included marble baths and indoor gymnasium and meeting rooms. And there was a broad porch where mothers would sit in rocking chairs with their babies. A running track encircled the park which areas set aside for a children's garden and outdoor play equipment. And it was all divided by curving paths and plantings. So I'd say the most important contribution of the playground reformers during this period was making play into policy. Um, you know, following what Roosevelt said, they were setting aside space within these rapidly expanding cities for play. Um, and children and families were no longer dependent on individual charities or tied to the settlement movement to get these spaces. Um, and you can see the, the change from that kind of free form and very individualized planning to Beaux-Arts planning and the City Beautiful movement, which took up the idea of playgrounds as part of its larger like planning ideals for the city. So this um, architecture with, it's sort of fussy celebration, separations of different kinds of play activity and a highly organized agenda really reflects the ideology of the child saving movement adopted as urban policy. Children were genuinely in danger on the city streets in these days. Um, in 1910, traffic accidents were the leading cause of death for children ages five to 14. And in 1908, there was a children's protest where 500 children marched up 11th Avenue, which was known as Death Avenue, carrying a coffin lid to protest the predations of the New York City Railroad. But well many adults also feared the effects of giving children too much freedom to roam. The streets were considered dangerous because of traffic and train traffic, but also because of the potentially corrupting influence of adults. So on the playgrounds, participating in games and exercises devised by professional play leaders, these American children were supposed to form a more perfect union. Um, and in order to do so, they needed to follow a program of directed activity rather than scrub play. So basically they were now supposed to be learning how to play baseball rather than some of the more informal games like stickball or kickball that you could just play with whatever equipment you had in the street. Team sports were supposed to force children from different backgrounds to work together towards a common goal, and they elevated group effort over individual achievement. Um, as psychologist Henry Curtis wrote, there is no more rich and poor in a scout patrol than there is in a baseball game you have to deliver the goods to get preferment. Play is the most democratic activity we know. So despite this emphasis on the melting pot nature of the playground, not every children in the US received the same training. Women's exercises were typically held on smaller sex segregated outdoor gymnasiums and women were supposed to avoid competitive sports. Um, there were even some people who suggested that uh, swinging on swings was too exciting for women. Um, and so they should be <laughs> only, only for boys. Um, black children were also provided with inferior facilities in another parallel to the early public school system. 
and they were typically left with the earlier generation of play spaces like vacant lots and closed off streets. In 1921, of, of, of almost 4,000 playgrounds and rec centers in the U.S., only 56 had a playground available for Black children, and only 14 cities had integrated playgrounds. So Emmett Scott, who was a secretary to Booker T. Washington, the famous um, early civil rights leader, wrote an editorial in the journal The Playground titled Leisure Time and the Colored Citizen, pointing out that the lack of playgrounds for Black children in both the urban North and the, the rural South. Ironically, um, today, a lot of play advocates see access to these more informal places like streets and vacant lots as a plus. And indeed, such activities are, are more likely to still be happening in low income neighborhoods. Um, lower income children also typically have more independence um, the middle class style of parenting, at least in the US, um, often insists that children be supervised at all times, um, that children play on equipment designed specifically for their age group, um, and that they be signed up for these formal teams and other sports activities. Um, and this kind of attitude towards play can be as limiting as the paternalistic exercises in teamwork um, that uh, were performed during the progressive era. During the pandemic, um, many cities initiated open streets programs, you know, similar to those from the past, but only a few of those uh, really prioritized play. Many others prioritized, you know, restaurants staying open or other adult activities. Philadelphia, which has had a play streets program for more than 50 years, um, provided the best options. Um, the city has more than 300 participating play streets across the city each summer. Um, and each of them is run by a volunteer supervisor who closes the street to traffic and offers daily meals and snacks. And during the summer of 2020, the first pandemic summer, 50 of those play streets morphed into something bigger, which was a free distributed summer camp, which you can see here in these images. Volunteers running the streets received a city series of kits. Um, and the kits contained balls, um, art supplies, cooling tools like super soakers, you know, like those like big um, colorful water pistols. Um, they also had misting tents and patio umbrellas. Um, and 50 or so super streets got daily staffed programming. Every Friday, those streets would have a dance party with a local DJ because the DJs like weren't able to work at clubs because they were all closed. So they were really happy to get the money to like offer the kids a dance party. Um, and ice cream trucks would also come by and offer the kids all free ice cream. And there was even a group called Play Streets of Wonder that worked literacy and math activities into the outdoor play um, with book wagons and arithmetic lessons incorporated into active games, bringing education and play together in the street. Um, so despite the emphasis on organized activities, Turn of the century playgrounds did have equipment, um, architectures like this built purely for play. The period photographs of Seward Park show a vast metal climbing frame with hooks for ropes and swings, kind of like this one. Um, and some of the photos show boys perched on the corners of those climbing frames, like 20 feet off the ground as if they were in a treetop. But reformers were pretty divided at the time over whether use of equipment did kids any good. Um, one described the psychological effects of swinging as similar to getting drunk. Um, others de de describe swinging as antisocial because you could do it by yourself. Um, it gives very little training to the eye or the hand or the judgment um, uh, that same psychologist Henry Curtis wrote. So, um, nonetheless, uh, all of this equipment proliferated and you know, proliferates to this day. One of the most interesting play equipment stories that I found was actually the invention of the jungle gym, which you can see here. Um, physical play was an important part of the progressive cur curriculum in Winnetka, Illinois, um, and the public schools there shared a full-time physical education teacher in the 1930s, which is still pretty rare. A local Winnetka patent attorney named Sebastian Hinton had grown up in Japan where he played on a multi-cube frame made out of bamboo, which had been created by his mathematician father. 
It was originally built to teach three-dimensional coordinates, um, you know, like the grid in space, but the children really preferred climbing around it like monkeys, which led to the name Jungle Gym. Hinton met the head of the Winnetka schools at a dinner and the two worked on a prototype for a similar climbing frame, this one made of iron pipes. Um, and this is the patent drawing for it that you can see here. Um, and they made this climbing structure and installed it at one school in 1920. A 1948 advertisement for the Jungle Gym, which took off and was installed in thousands of playgrounds, um, claims that the structure has more than 100 million child play hours without one serious accident. It is called the magnet of the playground and designed to meet the requirements of the Federal Housing Authority, which meant that it can be installed at like public subsidized housing sites. So despite these manufacturer claims for safety, there were actually no federal regulations specifically addressed towards playground apparatus until the 1970s. Um, but by the end of World War II, the standard playground in the US was well enough established that it had started to become dull and the baby boom provoked a second expansion of public facilities for children in both the city and the suburbs. While many public officials were content with the four S's, the sandbox, the slide, the swing, and the seesaw, the post-war focus on controlling and improving the lives of children and rebuilding cities led to an explosion of new forms for outdoor play. The sand pile is an obvious precursor to the junk playgrounds of the post-war era, which set lightly supervised children loose on piles of wood and trash and often feature great muddy sand piles of their own. The prime mover behind the post-war junk playground movement was an aristocrat from England, Lady Allen of Hurtwood. Um, she was one of many women like those original Boston settlement house ladies who have important roles in the history of children's play. Lady Allen had seen the first junk playground in Emdrup outside Copenhagen, where it became a refuge for youth who were then under German occupation. In 1945, Allen was asked to join a study group looking at European examples of what to do with orphaned and displaced children. And at a stop in Copenhagen, she was taken by the head of the local Froebel Institute to see this new play space established by landscape architect, Carl Theodore Sorensen. Sorensen had set up an enclosed area of slightly more than one acre where a play leader provided children with scraps of wood, metal and brick and basic tools. As Sorensen wrote, of all the things I have helped to realize, the junk playground is the ugliest, Yet for me, it is the best and most beautiful of my works. When the playground opened, the local housing association imposed, employed an adult play supervisor named John Bertelson. Um, and Bertelson's diaries are excerpted in this book you see here called The Child's Right to Play. Um, he wrote in his diary, at 10.45 a.m. today, the playground opened. We began by moving all the building material in the open shed, Bricks, boards, fire posts, and cement pillars were moved to the left alongside the entrance and the building and digging started right away. The work was done by children four to 17. It went on at full speed and all the workers were in high spirits. Dust, sweat, warning shouts, and a few scratches all created just the right atmosphere. The children's play and work ground had opened and they knew how to take full advantage of it. Bertelson's diary served as an early expression of what's today known as playworker philosophy. He wrote, I cannot and indeed will not teach the children anything. At junk playgrounds, it's really up to the kids to build the equipment that they need under the very hands-off supervision of playworkers who are trained to facilitate but not interfere. Allen brought the ideas of MDROP back to Britain and published an article in the picture post that you can see called, Why Not Use Our Bomb Sites Like This? Her text began by critiquing the traditional playground as a place of utter boredom. It is little wonder, she wrote, that they prefer the dumps of rough wood and piles of bricks and rubbish of the bombed sites or the dangers and excitements of traffic. 
So Alan saw these junk playgrounds, which he eventually rechristened adventure playgrounds to make them more palatable to local planning councils as a tool of bottom-up reconstruction for European cities. But the concept swiftly traveled to the US um, where McCall's Magazine and the United Way established the yard in Minneapolis in 1949. President Harry Truman visited the site soon after it opened and McCall's put it on the cover of their magazine in 1950. Other locations with adventure playgrounds um, included Irvine and Berkeley, California, and even the Upper East Side in Manhattan. Allen traveled to the United States on a speaking tour in 1965 and even met Lady Bird Johnson at the White House. Um, the American press called her the no-nonsense dowager and the filler in of gaps. And I wanna point out while play practices have radically changed since then, the junk or adventure playground does endure. Berkeley's playground, which you can see here with the saw, has been open continuously since the 1960s. While in Japan, which invited Lady Allen to visit in the 1970s, a small but robust network of uh, adventure playgrounds continues to operate. And I was lucky enough to visit both in 2016. Um, a few years ago, a group backed by the prominent play researcher, Roger Hart, opened a new junk playground on Governor's Island in New York called The Yard in tribute to that original uh, Minneapolis playground. And um, that I can attest from personal experience because my kids have been there. Um, the yard is very successful and they open, offer open playground hours on the weekend and a summer camp where people can basically just run all over the island and get dirty and play with water and mud, um, which is very different from typical American summer camps. Um, but how could these rather anarchic ideas about play and dirt um, be combined with cities needs for regulation and parents need for control and worries about kids getting hurt. Not everybody is really comfortable with dirt and junk. Um, as the architect Richard Datner writes at the beginning of his book, Design for Play, the next best thing to a playground designed entirely by children is a playground designed by an adult, but incorporating the possibility for children to create their own places within it. So as Datner began to create play playgrounds for New York City in the 1960s, abiding by this principle, he had one major, major design influence in mind. Sculptor Isamo Noguchi had been trying to build an artistic playground in New York City since the 1930s. His designs were widely seen and admired, but in the end, only one playground would be realized at the scale of his ambition in Sapporo, Japan. As you can see here, and this was also the first image in my lecture. Um, Noguchi had no prior experience designing for children. His work at the time in the 1930s was primarily in portrait sculpture, and he had just begun to design stage sets and costumes for modern dance choreographers, including Ruth Page and Martha Graham. But children's play is kind of a dance that they make up as they go along, aided by curbs to traverse and walls to climb. So through a social connection, Noguchi got a meeting with Robert Moses, then the city's new parks commissioner, um, who had a mandate at the time to increase the number of playgrounds. Moses would go on to open 400 playgrounds, but he preferred to use standardized equipment and was dismissive, dismissive of uh, Noguchi's design for a play mountain. Um, but still Noguchi persevered. Uh, in 1950, Audrey Hess, the wife of the art news editor Thomas Hess, asked Noguchi to design a playground for a site near the United Nations headquarters, which were then under construction. And the UN had agreed to set aside the one acre plot as a way to give back to the community. Hess, whose philanthropic interests included both art and children's causes, thought that Noguchi would be able to combine the two in this very prominent site in the city. So Noguchi prepared the plaster model that you can see here um, with the architect Julian Whittlesley, and he combined a contoured ground plane that would have been made out of concrete with his jewelry-like metal equipment. But Moses also rejected this project. So Noguchi's idea of combining sculpture and play was if not mainstream, at least kind of widely adopted within the philanthropic and creative communities in the 1950s. Um, Noguchi, I think, was really 
the first to start this, but a lot of other architects and designers took up the challenge of making this kind of very beautiful and sculptural play equipment. The Museum of Modern Art actually held a competition for innovative outdoor equipment um, with, along with the children's catalog, Creative Playthings. And the designers in this competition produced a number of highly plausible designs, mostly in concrete. I love that this exhibition actually introduced sand and children into the very modernist, clean spaces of the Museum of Modern Art. And I really wish more of this equipment had actually made its way into parks. Uh, Sydney Gordon's tunnel maze, which you can see here on the right, actually has um, been spotted uh, in period photographs of play spaces, primarily in public housing. So some of these are still out there and occasionally somebody will send me a photo of one and ask me if I can ID it, which is always fun. But where Noguchi failed, Datner and his contemporary, the landscape architect Paul Friedberg would succeed in New York City. In 1965, um, John Lindsay uh, became mayor and he hired Thomas Hoving as parks commissioner. Hoving was very young, only 34, and he had a PhD in our history, and he really saw parks as part of the city's cultural life, not just as recreation facilities. So he treated them as stages for public performance and for art happenings. The Este and Joseph Lauder Foundation, the makeup magnates, offered to support the construction of a new playground north of Tavern on the Green on Central Park's west side. So after presenting rough sketches to the committee for a creative playground, Datner created a scale model of his design out of sticks and clay that could be shown to the public. And at the end of the meeting where he showed this model, the lauders made a request. Would the community raise funds to play for a full-time play worker since they were paying for the architect and cost of construction? And this act of fundraising and having a full-time worker ended up being an important glue holding the community together and helping this rather avant-garde design make it through city planning and other regulatory agencies during the process of design and construction. So the finished park that Datner designed um, includes a series of linked play elements built of concrete and stacked cobblestones, very common materials in New York City. Most of them curved, arranged around a racetrack shaped oval. Outside those elements is a paved path, which is ringed with benches, intended to be the domain of parents who don't necessarily like to get sand in their shoes. Inside, the whole play surface is sand, split down the middle by a long sculptural water trough, which is reminiscent of some of the garden designs of the Italian modernist Carlo Scarpa. Um, there are circular labyrinths and truncated cones a slide hill, um, and a fountain uh, encircled by steps. There's a jungle gym made of logs and horizontal steel bars, which offers one high vantage point, as well as a tree house that was built around one of eight existing trees. But Datner, who was thinking of the adventure playgrounds, also designed a building kit, which was kind of a cleaned up and reusable version of, of junk, um, these so-called play panels were made of half-inch plywood and came in two different sizes, and they could be notched together to create walls, houses, vehicles, and platforms, as you can see the children doing here. Short matching ladders could be propped against the sides of them to access the roof of the structures if they were built above children's heads. And children were very grateful for this playground. The architecture really made an impression on them. And you can see that in this thank you note that the architects received soon after the playground was completed with its like fairly accurate <laughs> drawings of all of the equipment. But it wasn't only American designers like Noguchi and Datner um, and Golden who brought a sculptor's eye to the problem of playground equipment. While Danish post-war playgrounds favored using the debris that cluttered some of the bombed out sites, in Amsterdam, a team led by town planner Jacoba Muller and energized by the architect Aldo van Eyck built more than 700 playgrounds using an inexpensive kit of parks consisting of concrete toadstools, half moon climbing frames, um, and sandboxes ringed with bench height walls. 
Um, this kit of parts allowed Van Eyck to customize the design over and over to fit the shape of the lot and pedestrian patterns. By keeping the elements simple and repetitive, Van Eyck was also able to keep the cost minimal as the 30 year history of this project can attest. Muller's goal when she initiated the program in 1947 was to build one new public play playground in every neighborhood in the city. Many of the locations uh, they ended up choosing were by requests for, from local residents, which allowed the planning department to benefit from residents' understanding of what their neighborhood really needed for post-war rebuilding. Most of the sites were vacant, abandoned, or war-damaged lots, or in between spaces left by the construction of new housing at the outskirts of the city's edge. Um, and you, I love this before and after where you can see this was an empty lot filled with debris. And then after um, Van Eyck gets his hands on it, it's this very modernist abstract place scape. Like Noguchi's designs, Van Eyck's were really stripped down, preferring to let children use their imaginations to animate the simple forms rather than making a figurative element that looked like an animal or a rocket ship or a school bus or any of the other things you often see on playgrounds. Instead, they got an abstraction of nature with pieces that played like a tree stump or a log or a low hanging branch. And here's another example. Um, like Noguchi's designs, there's also something stage set like about Van Eyck's plans. There's a lot of open space always for running around and movement even on these tight urban sites, and plenty of room for children to create their own games, either make-believe or sports. The playgrounds are almost always open to the surrounding streets, allowing the children to see and be seen, and for adults to pass through if they need to. Some of the later playgrounds were even installed on the median strips down the center lane of divided roadways, um, and I love that these are children's pieces of the city that are still wholly connected to the city. They aren't walled off or gated off like so many playgrounds are today. So sand, junk, and Datner's play panels all fall into the category of Lutz parts, which was a term invented in 1971 by Simon Nicholson, an architect in this essay called How Not to Cheat Children. Nicholson was in inspired by the junk playgrounds of London created by Lady Allen, and he wrote, in any environment, both the degree of inventiveness and creativity and the possibility of discovery are directly proportional to the number and kinds of variables in it. Children's environments, he goes on to say, are clean, static, and impossible to play around with. What has happened is that adults in the form of professional artists, architects, landscape architects, and planners have all the fun playing with their own materials, concepts, and planning alternatives. And then builders have all the fun building the environments out of real materials. And thus has all the fun and creativity been stolen. So he was really arguing, give the loose parts back to the kids. Don't let the designers have all the fun before the kids get there. So I would say, as you go forward with your own project, listen to Nicholson. Think about some of the through lines in more than a century of playground design. Think about how to provide the space for play and the tools of play, not to mention you know, other like-minded children to play with without stealing all the fun, creativity, and discovery for yourself. Um, so thanks so much for having me today. I'm gonna to conclude there, but I really look forward to your questions. Thank you so much, Alexandra. I think it was uh, really uh, refreshing and really, really cool, uh, cool topic that you have just presented. Uh, I we actually I put in the chat because we actually have one adventure playground in Poland that I know oh, of great. <laughs> uh, next to Lublin or in Lublin, and it's called the Reserve of Wild Kids. Yeah. And I think it really kind of uses the concept of adventure and junk playground. So I think it's really interesting. Uh, I'm wondering if anyone has any questions uh, from the from the audience. Oh, I see Julia had a raised hand. So yeah, Julia. Yeah. Hello. Thank you very much for your um, your speech. It was really interesting, and it's uh, really close to my team uh, item because we work in uh, education part, and uh, our school, uh, which want to 
participate in our project uh, said they that they need a space outdoor space where children can uh, have fun but um, the first thing that i understand the biggest problem um, to create a, a huge and interesting playground for children in the school or kindergarten it's a problem that uh, in uh, during the day during the study children are under the teacher's responsibility if i must say it clear and uh, in this case teachers don't want to uh, go away uh, outdoor with children because they must to watch and uh, watch them and one teacher or two teacher for a big uh, pool of the children and it's problem and when something happened the first person who will <laughs> responsible for that it's a teacher and uh, this teacher will be listening by the parents and others what's happening with my children <laughs> how we can work with that because uh, teachers don't want to uh, to do that to do, uh, do this work but we must to give a uh, uh, freedom for children for their childhood yeah yeah no see that I mean, that's a that's a culture problem, not a design problem or like that's where the culture problem kind of comes before the design problem um, and culture problems are really hard to solve. I think in like if I were to recommend, I feel like both the parents and the teachers like need to like be educated in the idea that, you know, kind of letting kids move their bodies during the day really helps them to learn more. And also in how there is this long history of kind of physical outdoor activity as part of education, because I think typically schools see outdoor time as sometimes as a waste or like as recess is kind of like just for running around and blowing off steam, which it definitely is. But like the, the schools that are more successful in integrating outdoor time into their whole educational project, then the teachers get on board and they also understand that it's not like a separate thing to be asking them, but it's a, an essential part of their job. I mean, and I think things like having outdoor gardens that are a little less wild, but like can clearly be like the planting and the tending and the like learning about botany and other things from the outdoor garden as Froebel intended, like can be part of an outdoor design and outdoor activity. Also, you know, having clear rules, um, kind of a code of conduct for how you play on the playground, offering children more of an opportunity to self-regulate and self-police. So it's not all on the adults. Um, and I think that can like some of the playwork philosophy that goes along with the junk playgrounds can really help with that because it's a, it, it's a different kind of supervision. So, I mean, I think it's really in a way a problem of re-education so that parents understand that this isn't an add-on, but an essential part of like how we grow up and learn social skills and stay active. Okay, so I want to say, if I yeah. clear, uh, understand yeah. clearly, that uh, we might, uh, in the idea, uh, ideal... Uh, yeah, I know it's always in an ideal world, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, in the ideal world, we must to have uh, uh, some rules for children, for example, um, because we don't want they are die. <laughs> <laughs> So we must to uh, to do some some rules for them, and of course we must to have a uh, oh my gosh my English uh, um, uh, a deal with uh, children uh, with uh, teachers and uh, parent they, that teacher will see will uh, see on the uh, children, but they can't to get all a responsibility for them, and the parents agree with that. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I mean, that's a great summary. Yes. That okay. that would be a great thing to accomplish. I mean, and there there is like a very like robust body of research around risky play. Um there's a woman named I think it's Ellen Sandstetter 
um, who has established that like it's very necessary for children's um, kind of maturation to have these opportunities to test themselves, to have these opportunities to like negotiate their own conflicts. And in fact, like it, it's very negative that so often today, everything is so highly supervised and like mediated with adults. So I guess, I mean, it's like education researchers, psychological researchers, like, um, you know, play experts all agree that having a little bit more risk in children's lives is ultimately very helpful. Like they need to be able to make some decisions for themselves. Um, and I know, for example, you know, there's this junk playground on Governor's Island and everybody, you have to sign a liability waiver before you go there, but they've only really had one injury and it was relatively minor in the like five years that they've had the junk playground. Like there's something about the messiness of it that makes that, often fills parents with fear, but that is like not borne out at all. Like children, I don't know, I think the bottom line of all of this is that like children are smarter than we think. And if we give them more opportunities to you know show that to us, they will take the, the us up on that and it will have a positive effect. Okay, thank you very much for your answer. Sure. sure. Thanks. I think there is a lot about like control and protection uh, in the topic of play, right? Uh, yes, yes, very much. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, is there anyone who wants to ask the next question? Oh, there is something in the chat. Oh, yeah. Helicopter parenting, all I says. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, who wants to ask the next question for uh, Alexandra? Otherwise, it would be me because I have a lot of questions. But maybe there's anyone who wants to go first. No, okay. Then I I would just jump in uh, with some of my question my questions. I was I don't know if it's more like a question or a reflection, but I was thinking a lot uh, about kind of the relationship with dirt and how it changes over our lifetime. And when we're kids, we are basically allowed to 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 get dirty and to to play in dirt and just to to kind of, you know, go into the mud and the water and everything. And when we get older, the culture kind of um, doesn't allow us anymore to, uh, to to be dirty and kind of celebrate the uh, the order and the, the hygiene and so on. And I feel like uh, we are losing so much as adults because we are not used to getting dirty. And like, uh, I was thinking if there are any, I don't know, initiatives or ways of actually kind of going against this kind of cultural uh, thing. Are there any like examples or like good practices of how we can actually get back to, to getting dirty as, as adults? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's interesting. I mean, I think that the like small, but but very feisty like junk playground movement that has started up it, again in the US is helping with that, you know, from the children on up, but they don't, say specifically have adult hours in the junk mm -hmm. playground. So that's kind of an interesting idea. I will say, you know, I've, I've given versions of this lecture in a lot of places and a lot of adults just even want to play on the play equipment. Like it's not, it's not just getting dirty. It's just playing at all that has been taken out of adult lives. And when they see some of these like larger and more elaborate playgrounds, you know, like the Noguchi playground in Japan, they're like, oh, wait, like we could play too. So I think, unfortunately, like I haven't seen like an organized movement towards that, but I think that like is a very true insight and maybe like the liberation of adults will come from the greater liberation of children. Like for too long, we've imposed this kind of adult structure on children's lives and like maybe slowly people are starting to push back on that, but it could also... I mean, it will also be liberating for adults because, I mean, there was the, the comment in the chat about helicopter parenting. Helicopter parenting takes up a lot of adults' time and energy. And mm -hmm. if you don't have to supervise your children all the time, like think how much more that opens up to you. Mm -hmm. I mean, I like I live in New York City, um, so I don't know how relevant this will be, but I feel like just making the streets safer so that children can have more independent movement so that say they can walk to their friend's house safely 
like, would make a big difference because again, like that is time that a parent has to spend like just walking their child from door to door that they shouldn't have to if cities were really designed um, for full family lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there is also like a lot of kind of how we design our streets, right? For yes. if there is what, are, what the functions of the street actually are. I was reading uh, lately about uh, like different forms of like kind of urban prototyping and prototyping like new functions of space. And actually there was a lot about, uh, for example, getting cars out of the street and just uh, leaving the space for people, not only kids, but like all people who, who are passing by uh, just to play or to draw something or just to, to do something there that will be kind of something that they would like to do in this space. So I think there is actually a lot of, a lot in it about safety and like having actually uh, being given the space to to actually you know explore and play and and get dirty as well maybe yeah. yeah i mean the um so the the new york city junk playground group like the junk playground is only in one location mm -hmm. but they now offer like pop-up play experiences mm -hmm. so if a neighborhood closes off a street on a weekend for like the kind of activity that you're talking about um, they will come and bring like a whole mess of like cardboard boxes and other play pieces and set up kind of a mini um, freeform play experience. And that's another way to kind of get more of the neighborhood like available to children and activated mm -hmm. in this play space. Um, really so I think things like that, like those pop-ups can also be a really effective technique, even if you don't have the money or space for a mm -hmm. full-time playground. Really cool. Yeah. Okay, Ola, I think you're the next. Yeah, um, I think before I uh, before I ask my question, I just wanted to build on what you said, Martina. And there is actually this concept of super blocks that has been tested in Barcelona, mm -hmm. where they cross some of the cross sections completely for the usage of of communities living there, um, and and stopping the cars from going there, but using the streets like the surface of the street to let the kids play and and organize some some pop-up events, just um, FYI thing. But yeah, um, I guess I want to start by saying that for me, the, the, the curiosity of the kids and their pers persistence in asking questions and asking why and how and what is just something incredibly inspiring. Um, but I'm thinking now a little bit about the process of, of like rebuilding and revitalizing um cities but also in this context of a program doing that with the ukraine and have a feeling like the, the this process can be very uneven and very slow so there is um a lot of competing demands right when the rebuilding or revitalization happens for attention for money for resources for for everything basically and i'm curious i guess my question is um, if there are some examples or maybe some, you know, um, insights or tips on how to ensure within the policymakers, for example, that the creation of like playful spaces or playfulness in generally will be integrated into like a border context or border efforts. And if, um, I mean, how to ensure that that role is there and that that, that effort is there. Yeah, yeah. I mean that's I mean that's right, right. That's one of that's the one of those political, political, political wait, sorry. Wait, I'm just sorry, I'm just getting an echo. Echo. Yeah, me, me too, actually. Um, yeah. okay, now I find might it. be from Ola, yeah. Oh yeah, okay. oh yeah. Yeah, I muted now, so that should work better. Sorry. Okay. I mean, in general, I think that the way like they're kind of two ways that I think this has worked politically in the past. One is the Lady Allen way, where she basically like wrote um, a highly illustrated, very effective argumentative article in like a major publication in her city that said like, this is the way it should be. And so that got a lot of attention. Um, it had a lot of visual impact. And she said like, yes, we need it here. So that's like the PR route. Um, the other route is that there are a lot of international organizations that are already like working very hard on this question of children's right to the city, the safety of children, kind of redesigning cities for children. And I know the Bernard Van Leer Foundation has already been very 
active in Europe and also Eastern Europe, um, they have a program called Urban 95, uh, which is sort of consider the city from the height of somebody who's 95 centimeters tall, which is like a, the height of read to be convincing. And it'll give you access to good examples of like, okay, this city was in this state 10 years ago. And as part of their rebuilding, they incorporated play. Um, so, I mean, I guess those would be my primary su suggestions. I think that you should never underestimate the, um, the effectiveness of like photographs of children playing, like almost nobody can resist that. And so you're kind of saying like, we want our future city to be like this. We want our future city to have this joy. And so like finding good um, analogous photos of children playing in the kind of environment you want to build and then trying to get those out there by whatever means you can, like can be just a very effective like frontline strategy. Yeah, so you can basically use the joy as a winning card in this case. Yes, yes. Right? I right? mean, we all, I mean, need, we more all need more joy. Oh, definitely, yeah. <laughs> right, thank you. Thanks, thanks. Okay, we have uh, Yulia next. And there's Shimon. Yeah, thank you very much. Sorry, I, I have a question again. <laughs> uh, uh, you said, uh, how I said that uh, our project uh, is uh, with uh, education and children and they want to create uh, their outdoor place. And I want to ask you, you said about this, but uh, can you repeat uh, about uh, where we can find an information from the books or courses, how to create a, a play, um, playground for children with children because the sense of the uh, our project it's uh, teachers and uh, pupils create their own project in uh, in the outdoor uh, item and they uh, will to create and maybe build that so how uh, how to work with the children and create with them but not yeah. pressure on them yeah. Um, well, I mean, I have a number of books I can rec recommend. Like one that I really like a lot is called The Playwork Primer. Um, and it's written by, sorry, I'm just going to Google this real quick. It's written uh, by uh, Penn. Oh, sorry, sorry, oh, wait, sorry. I should put it in the chat. Yeah. Yeah, sorry. that would be great. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, it will um, be perfect. Because for me, it's too difficult to. Sure. Uh, listening. Okay, so the Playwork Primer by Penny Wilson um, is a great place to start. There's also, sorry, I'm like trying to look at my bookshelf because, um, oh yeah, there's also a book called Designing Streets for Kids um, published by NACTO, which is the North American Transportation Association. And it's very, it's good because it actually has some prototype designs, but it also has an excellent bibliography. I mean, it has my book in it, but it it can point you to a lot of um, articles and like recent publications of other people doing this work. Um, and the other, I should, I'm also gonna put in this Bernard Van Leer Foundation, just so you have the spelling, mm -hmm. because they also have a, a lot of um, good resources. So I think those are all like good places to start. Uh, okay, thanks. And I have a, que a question. Oh, you said it in the uh, answer before, but I want to please you to write that because how I said, yeah. uh, for, uh, for me it's a problem for hearing uh, about organization which are which works in the uh, way of the outdoor for children and which interested in uh, for foundation or some helps for uh, groups who, who want to do that. Um, yeah, yeah, oh wait, somebody just, yes, it is the Urban 95 Academy, that's correct. And I also, I, so yeah, it is, it's the Bernard Van Leer Foundation and then their Urban 95 program. Um, and I'm also going to write in the chat 
the woman who does the research on risky play, because I feel like this is an important like pressure point for a lot of parents, especially like the idea that if you change the way children play and take it away from this like very plastic mass produced play equipment, like they're going to get hurt. Um, and she has proven and is quoted in lots of places um, that like that is just not the case. Like children are better and will be stronger at dealing with like um, irregular surfaces, irregular situations if they have the opportunity to do that in a kind of constrained environment. Um, and the other person, sorry, now I'm like thinking of all my references. The other person you should look up um, is Tim Gill, um, who's a researcher and he wrote a book called No Fear. And he also wrote a more recent book um, with some great examples, mostly in Europe of cities that have been redesigned for play. Um, I'm just looking up the name of that. Uh, and it's called Urban Playground. So yeah, I mean, I, all, all of these people like are referenced in my book and I refer to them a lot and, and they're doing ongoing really great work in this space. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Okay, uh, Shimon, can you stand for your question? Yeah, uh, first of all, thank you very much for the, uh, for the talk. It was great to listen how the idea of child's children's play uh, was present in the main discourse throughout the years. And uh, now as we are talking about it, the sort of main subjects that appear are uh, safety concerns and uh, idealism of uh, and, and our ideal views of how this whole area could be organized. And I apologize for going into this grim area, but um, I just couldn't help thinking about how it kind of transfers to our reality where uh, mass shootings at schools are quite common and where the idea of designing spaces for children where they should feel safe to, to play and to, to, to learn, um, those spaces are being introduced with uh, bulletproof equipment and so on and so on. So I'm just really curious about your professional perspective on that process. Um, yeah. 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 No, that's a really tough subject. Um, I mean, in the US at least, it's come more into school design and kind of defensive school design than it has to playground design, though of course, like many school sites include the playground. Um, I think the truth is that the US needs better gun control policies and like no amount of architectural design or defensive design will ever be able to do enough unless we have better gun control policies and ban assault weapons. Like, like this is not a problem that design can ultimately solve. Um, however, I think that, I think that it's, I, I just, I guess this is idealistic, but I just think that it's the wrong idea to remove like true public gathering spaces and community spaces from your cities because you're afraid of guns, because it's the kind of polarization and, and lack of community that causes many people to become paranoid and to like behave in these manners and use guns in the way they do. So like if we all retreat to bunkers, like we don't have a society anymore. So um I agree that we have to protect children as much as possible. In the US, the leading causes of death for children are traffic accidents. So like back to like designing safer streets for everyone and gun accidents. And I just think that in both cases, like design can do a lot, but ultimately like this is a regulatory problem. Um, and like th there's just no way, like there's no way to make a bulletproof enough environment. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, as you said earlier, it's more a cultural problem than a design problem. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's so tricky because I I feel like I want to have a solution to give people. And I always have to say, like, design can do this much, but 
and and like talking about the cultural change required can do this much but ultimately it's like you know millions of people that have to change um and you only like a, an individual person and an individual project can only do so much and like we should try to do as much as we can but um it's hard to know how it's going to add up in the end thank okay. you thank you uh ola yeah, I want to go now on a bit more, again, joyful side of the topic after that question and ask um, if you believe uh, with all the knowledge you have about the play playgrounds and the playfulness in childhood, if you believe that play can have a healing power? Oh, definitely. Oh, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, I think... I think the thing that like the thing that fear takes away in a lot of cases is is freedom and autonomy, you know, to go outside, to travel, to to be with other people, to find your friends. And play is an activity that can like bring all of those things back together. Um I know I showed you the example um of the Philadelphia Play Streets, which I thought were really really important in that first summer of the pandemic because typically um, the city had had, you know, a big camp all in one location and they realized that that, you know, like everyone would get COVID if they had the camp like that again with indoor spaces and like a lot of kids together. But if they brought the camp to the kids and kind of took over the streets and all of these neighborhoods and brought the activities out there, then children could make better connections in their neighborhoods. They would have this play activity right on their doorstep. Um, it would help with loneliness. It would help with, you know, kids not getting enough exercise, enough sun. So, yeah, I really think that deployed properly um, and deployed equitably, you know, play can have a huge healing power and, and give children back some of the autonomy to, you know, make their old friends, move their bodies, like invent their own games that a, a lot of them are lacking from a lot of different circumstances. Thank you for that. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree here. And I think it was in your book that you wrote uh, in the in the childhood um, book that you said that uh, children should be treated as citizens rather than as product. And I think that's, that's a, summing it up nicely. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. We should yeah. Like, give back I, the agency with that playfulness to the kids. So. I keep returning. I keep returning to the word to the word independent in the subtitle to my book. And I feel like that is what this is all about. It's about like giving children the independence um, that they that's age appropriate so that they can grow into adults with independent minds and bodies, you know, who are also seeking freedom. And, and the idea of just circumscribing them into, you know, the, the people or the spaces that like adults think are best is it, just not the way. Um, and they they won't you know grow up to be able to like have their own thoughts to do their own work to be creative 